Some players don't need a lot of awards or to even play for the greatest teams in the world to leave a mark in the world of football. Some leave a mark just by being who they are, by taking on the pitch without being afraid of innovating, doing stuff their own way. That's how they make it, the beautiful game. How they capture the attention of young impressionable minds who might one day live to be one of the greats just like them. Today we talk about a player who is talked of to be the main influence of Ronaldinho's play style, as well as others like Neymar, Mario Gomez and Robinho. Welcome to the career of a man larger than life, JJ Okosha. He was born Augustine Azuka Okosha. In fact, it was his older brother who was first given the nickname JJ, as he was actually called James. Regardless, it stuck for young Augustine and led to perhaps the most repeated joke in the history of football. JJ Okosha, so good they named him twice. His first encounter with football happened in the streets like many other kids of other times. He said it himself in an interview with BBC. As far as I can remember, we used to play with anything, with any round thing we could find. And whenever we managed to get a hold of a ball, that was a bonus. I mean, it was amazing. Little is known about his time in Nigeria. At some point in time, he joined Enugu Rangers, apparently directly into the first team, and very quickly, he became a sort of celebrity there. But the moment that would define the rest of his career would come in a very unusual way. After his first season in 1990, he traveled to Germany so he could watch some Bundesliga matches and eventually visit one of his friends. But the thing is that one friend was Binebi Numa, who played for Borussia Nienkirchen in the German third division. As JJ watched one of their training sessions, he dared to ask the most important question of his life. Can I join? And thankfully, they said yes. By the end of the training session, everyone was in awe of his skills. Who is this guy? They asked. At first, the coach decided to merely ask him to come back the next day, but once beginner's luck was ruled out, he immediately offered him a contract. Over that first year, Akosha played 35 matches and scored 7 goals, and history repeated itself. One year was all it took to get him his next move, and once again it would be an odd one. Okosha would move to FC Zagbrücken in the 2nd division, but before he even managed to play a match for them, another team would come knocking at his door, Eintracht Frankfurt. They made sure Zagbrücken would still profit from the move and took Okosha immediately. From Nigeria to the Bundesliga in little more than a year, JJ must have been over the moon and rightfully so. After a season of fighting for minutes at his new club, came his first major iconic moment. As Eintracht faced Karlsruhe, Okosha faced the mightiest of all, Oliver Kahn. As Eintracht led 2-1, Okosha found the ball at his feet, as Kahn angrily stared at him. It was like the wild wild west. First move was Okosha's. He faked one way and went the other. Khan threw himself in front of the ball only to find himself laying on the ground far from it. His duo of centre-backs desperately tried to stop Okosha, but one fell and somehow managed to be the one who looked the least like an idiot. It was as if Okosha waited for Khan to get up before punishing him once again with a dagger of a shot that he would never be able to stop. It was easily the goal of the year. And years later, Khan would still recall it by telling the press that he was still dizzy from all the back and forth. Okosha had proven he was a player like no other, standing out especially in a league like the Bundesliga, known for a strong, burly, rigid football where only tactics could ever be enough to break through the mighty German walls, but there he was, making all of them crumble and bow down to his magical powers. Okosha would influence a generation of German footballers. Mario Gomes would tell the press that this goal was what defined his career. Back before it, he never watched football on TV. He felt it was too boring to sit down when you could just go out and play yourself, but one day, his father sat him down and told him to watch just this one goal. It was Okosha, and little Mario was in awe. From there on out, every Sunday, he sat and watched the highlights of the former match day with his father. Over the year of 1993, Okosha would rise to relevance in the Nigerian national team after scoring a free kick in their World Cup qualification decisive match against Algeria. The following year would come the World Cup itself, but before it, there was still time for the African Cup of Nations, where despite only once playing a full match and not scoring a single goal, JJ Okosha would not only help Nigeria, 
but he would do it in such style that he managed to be one of the four Nigerians that made the team of the tournament after they beat Zambia to the title in the final. Coming off of this success, there was great hope for Nigeria in the World Cup. Okosha would once again not be in the starting lineup for the first few matches, but he would come off two minutes before the end of their match against Argentina, which just happened to be Maradona's last ever official match for his national team. His first full match would come against Italy, where this time he would meet Roberto Baggio, who would be in the form of his life. As Nigeria led by one goal with two minutes to go, Baggio would score to take them to extra time, where he would score again to end their World Cup dreams. Still, Okosha would make it into the stories of two of the greatest players of the 1990s. Okosha would watch as for the next two seasons, Eintracht fell into mediocrity. By 1996, they had fallen down to 17th place in the Bundesliga. It was time to shake things up, so as the Super Eagles went into the 1996 Olympic Games, JJ was ready. The group stage would be a breeze, qualifying for the next stage right from their second game. The final match would still stand out though, as Nigeria faced Brazil head-on and made sure they struggled to defeat them. The quarter-finals would see them facing Mexico, who had beat them in the Confederations Cup just the previous year, but that was only an extra motive to get back at them. From early on, an incredible goal by Okosha put them in front and eventually they'd make it to the semi-finals, where they would have to face Brazil again, the only team who had defeated them so far. If in the first match Brazil struggled, this time it wouldn't be the case. By halftime Brazil led 3-1, it was clear they had learned how to exploit Nigeria's weaknesses, but you know what? So had Nigeria, and so the match got turned around. Early in the second half, a penalty was awarded to Nigeria, Okosha stepped up and missed. It seemed like it just wasn't their lucky day. With little more than 10 minutes to go, the goal finally came. And then, in injury time, as Nigeria needed a lifeline, Okosha took the throw in, and after a huge mess in the box, the ball hit the net after a touch by Kanu. They were going into extra time. But first, one fun fact. Back then, extra time meant that the first team to score would win. So, just four minutes passed, and a long ball went through bounced off the forwards back and Kanu was in position. One swift shot, an iconic celebration and Nigeria were through to the Olympic final. What a match! The final would be an incredibly exciting match as well. Argentina would go in front twice with Nigeria tying the match in both occasions and once again going in front in injury time, even though Okosha had shockingly been subbed off. Regardless, Nigeria had won gold at the Olympics and their incredible squad had made sure they would never be forgotten. As they came back from the Olympic Games, Okosha finally put an end to his time in Germany, as his relationship with Hub Heinkes had severely deteriorated. His next club would be Fenerbahce, where surely Turkish fans would be in love with his flamboyant playstyle. In his first league game, he would assist and score an incredible goal from outside the box. This kind of performance would perfectly encapsulate his time at Fenerbahce. It seemed that he was incapable of scoring a goal that wasn't absolutely stunning, and considering how often he was scoring them, it was impossible not to be impressed. Later in the season, he would meet Manchester United at Old Trafford, and his magnificent performance would be a big part of how they managed to end United's incredible 40-year unbeaten run at home in the Champions League. Towards the end of the season, Okosha would score in four consecutive matches as he tried to get the title for his team, but still they would fail. Regardless, Okosha had managed an incredible 16 goals and 12 assists in the league, completely asserting himself as one of the best players in Turkey. His second year would be equally incredible. Okosha would keep destroying every team he faced, still displaying a special liking for rivals Galatasaray, who he scored against in every match they played for the two years he spent in Turkey. Unfortunately, the year would end without a title once again, and it would be the end of this chapter as the exhibitions that came next would make him one of the most sought-after players in Europe. At the 1998 World Cup, a lot was expected from Nigeria. But even as they went out in the round of 16, with Okosha failing to ever get on the score sheet, the tournament had served to showcase the talent of JJ, and the world was ecstatic over what they had seen. Even if the tournament might have seemed like a failure, it would set off the next chapter, as it would be the key piece to convincing PSG to fork out 13 million euros for the player, making him 
the most expensive African player of all time. There was hope Akasha would provide the team with the magic necessary to bring them back to glory, but honestly, at first it just wasn't enough, even in a squad that had players like Anelka, Pochettino and Mikel Arteta. His second season would be the first glimmer of hope. PSG would prove to have taken substantial steps ahead, but unfortunately, it became clear early on that they would trail behind Monaco in second place. The kicker would come in the Coupe de France though. PSG would perform incredibly all the way up to the final, where they would meet Gouignon, who at the time were playing in second division and looking to be bound to stay there. It should have been the most straightforward win of all time, but the gods of football just seemed to love an underdog, so of course they won. Not by one, but two nil, and the following season, despite still being in the second division, they would get to play in the UEFA Cup. As you might imagine, they got immediately knocked out. Over summer would come the African Cup of Nations, where despite going through suspension and missing the semi-final, it would be a big deal in the final, scoring as Nigeria came from being two goals down, but it would not be enough, as eventually the penalty shootout would see them going out of the tournament without silverware. The next season would bring Champions League football to Paris, but they would fail to make it out of the group stage and their domestic performances would suffer from it, causing many to start doubting this squad had what it took to make it big. Thankfully, the arrival of a 22-year-old Ronaldinho would set it all ablaze. He was reckless, fiery, but also incredible to watch, a true force of nature, and Okosha, maybe because he could see a little bit of himself in the young boy, decided to take him under his wing, referring to him as his younger brother. At the beginning of the season, PSG would win the Intertoto Cup after facing Roberto Baggio's Brescia in the final and they would go on to have a much better season than the previous ones, while also displaying some of the most visually appealing plays you could ever imagine. By the end of it, Okosha would claim to be very proud that he got to be a mentor to Ronaldinho, that he got to be an essential piece of the progress of turning Ronaldinho into a world-class player. He would also say that Ronaldinho was his favorite teammate ever, that he felt they were so similar, they didn't even need to communicate, they could just know what the other was about to do. As football fans, we could have only wished to have had a few more seasons of this amazing duo, but unfortunately that was it. After negative performances at both the 2002 World Cup and the African Cup of Nations, PSG decided that it was time to let go of Akosha was one of the club's highest earners and was about to run out of his contract. After all, keep in mind he was about to become 29 years old. Older players tend to make outrageous moves, but not many can beat this one. Seeing Okosha out of a contract, Sam Allardyce, coach of Bolton, who had just gotten promoted to the Premier League, decided to bid for Okosha. You know, just in case it sticks. So imagine his shock when they end up meeting and Okosha straight up tells him he wants to join and in the most nonchalant way ever, he just ends up driving from Paris to Bolton the following day to sign the contract. The whole saga seemed more like a sitcom gag than a real transfer. JJ and Sam couldn't be more different but suddenly, Bolton, who were expected to get relegated straight back to the championship, now had in their possession one of the most high-profile star players in the league. By the end of the year, Okosha led the goal-scoring shards among the squad, despite a modest tally of just 7 goals. Still, that had been enough to perform the miracle of keeping Bolton at the top flight and making them into one of the most entertaining squads in the league. So much was their admiration towards Okosha that just in his second season he would be made captain, which clearly would pay off as a brace of free kicks in the League Cup semi-final would historically take Bolton to a final, though they would lose on minimal margin. And besides that, they would also end up in 8th place in the Premier League. What had Okosha done for this team? Well, at the bare minimum, he had provided them with credibility. If two years earlier signing a top player seemed like the craziest thing, now they were getting players like Fernando Hierro and Ivan Campo from Real Madrid and even Candela from Roma. Astonishing what a single transfer can do for a team. In this multicultural squad, Okosha proved even more essential as a captain, since he was able to speak multiple languages and became more and more the glue that held the team together and that led them to a shocking 6th place finish and a qualification to the UEFA Cup. Over summer, he took part in the African Cup of Nations, scoring an incredible 4 goals in just 6 matches, earning them a bronze medal and proving that he still had more than enough juice in him to power the Super Eagles towards victory.
In its final year at Bolton, Okosha would help the team make it out of the UEFA Cup group stage after facing the likes of Sevilla and Zenit, and they nearly made it through Marseille in the knockout stage had it not been for a known goal. After all of this, Okosha decided his work was done. He believed he had permanently changed the path of the club and it was time to go. After all, by now he was 32 years old. Unfortunately, though at first Bolton would keep it up, even beating Atlético de Madrid at one point. Soon after, Okosha would witness Bolton go through a sharp decline, already battling for relegation a bit more than a year after his departure. Okosha was upset and he made it public knowledge, but still, it was too late. He had already left for Qatar. He spent one year there before writing his final chapter. As many assumed the move to the MLS was in the books, Okosha once again shocked the world by moving to Hull City, who were playing the championship at the time. When asked as to what was the reason behind this move, he simply replied that God told him to do so. It's hard to determine if it was a successful move or not. It seems JJ had far more planned for it than what he actually managed to achieve. Injuries took over and he only managed 19 matches for the club over that season. Still, it was enough to help them achieve promotion for the first time in the club's 104 year long history. It took some time to decide whether or not it was time to go, but in the end, he decided that was it and retired. What a way to put an end to a career, only someone like Okosha could have pulled it off. He retired with only two club trophies, but a truckload of iconic moments, great memories and with the knowledge that he had made the difference for several clubs and for millions of fans, who for the time they spent with him, knew that every game would have something worth remembering. Okosha dazzled and inspired millions, through his feints, through his dribbles, through his incredible free kicks and above all, for his sheer audacity to be unapologetically himself, proving time and time again that football is far more than a sport, it is an art form through which you can express yourself. Whether you're by yourself in your own backyard or in a stadium packed with 80,000 people willing to scream your name in adoration, perhaps they named him twice because he was that much greater than life. So yeah, that was JJ Okosha's career in a video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye.